I think I've struck lucky. I've got barrels and barrels of this lovely, lovely jet fuel. Now, Terence, be a dear, keep an eye out for the law. I expect there's a drink in it for me, Arthur. A drink? A drink? Bit early for a drink, isn't it? No drink, no look. Catch you later. Parasite. <laughs> Cripe, it's the law! Scarpa! Today we're looking at the ZX Spectrum game Enterprise, first published by Melbourne House in 1987, costing £7.95, but that's not how I came to know it. I bought it on budget from Mastertronic for £2.99. A tale as old as time. You are an entrepreneur, trying for years to make money, only to be thwarted at every turn by small-minded, short-sighted, blood-sucking banks who refuse to part with any money. Your only recourse is to branch out into the new sphere of interplanetary merchant pilot. But even though you're obviously brilliant, you can't get any money to buy a spacecraft. So you steal one. Facing a lengthy prison sentence back home, your only hope is to earn enough money to retire to the Paradise Planet. You do this by collecting minerals and selling them to the traders on any one of five trillion planets into your ship's computer. The interplanetary police are unaware of the insignificant particle of dust in a dingy galaxy called Earth and are oblivious to your crime. However, they do not suffer lightly criminal activity in their area. Does crime pay? Only you can decide. Once loaded, you're prompted to enter your name, which will be important later, and are then given a choice of controls. We support three types of joystick, Kempton Interface 2 or Cursor, or Keyboard, which is mainly Q, A, O, P and N. Other keys are involved. You have your ship's dashboard with many, many numbers. On the top you have the X coordinates, the Y coordinates, which are red, which means they're negative, and the Z coordinates. These have more digits than are on the screen, but you can move them in the night and as a zoom. Bottom right you have a heart rate monitor, that's just for fun. You can turn the sound off with a Z. Here you have your scanners. The left is your vertical scanner. The right is the horizontal scanner. Two levels of zoom. You get to control your ship in all three dimensions. You can control your yaw. Uh, red is negative, which is in this case going left. Green is positive, going right, going right or starboard if you prefer. All along the, the planet rotates rather beautifully. You can control your pitch with standard flight sim control, so pressing down makes you go up, pressing up makes you go down, as if you're pulling back on, on a joystick, or a yoke perhaps. And you can also roll. You roll by pressing fire and then left or right. And here I'm rolling to the left, so a nice dead-on view of the planet which spins in space. Now, you don't want to immediately land on the planet, you want to head off into space to gather some minerals. Your full speed is 99,900. You can press I to keep check your inventory and your current status. We've got 500 pounds, 497 kilos of food, no minerals in class A through class P, no insurance, and our current target is 10,054 pounds. This is constantly increasing. You can also press R, give you a report on the state of your ship. Engines, boosters, fuselage, landing gear, photon shield, cargo bay door, food storage and braking system are all A-OK. -okay. If you want to go faster than 99,900, you can engage your boosters, which allows you to go up to 399,900. However, using boosters can damage nearby ships and would incur a fine from the interplanetary police. You also use a lot more fuel with boosters. You can, though, turn off your engines and just coast along. And you know, we're trying to get away from the planet in order to try and find some minerals in the vastness of space. The planet's slowly dropping behind us on the horizontal scanner. We are on an extreme zoom. 
Once it hits the edge, we are gone. And now there's something ahead of us in the distance and slightly above us. So we pitch up, just now straight up, and there we see something green in the distance wobbling about. Now these, my learned friends, are minerals. You find them in space, a series of crystals orbiting around each other, and you need to collect them by colliding with them. Not too fast though. So see here we are now starting to get rather close. I tend to find once you get close enough you just immediately start heading on the brakes. Below 300 of altitude you will actually start colliding with the rocks. So you want to be nice and slow. The slower you impact with them the better. If you go too slow you won't move. However speed of say 2500 will allow you to pick collect minerals without taking any damage at all. Here I'm coming to 11900 which will get me some slight damage. And note I've also opened the cargo bay doors. Get a little bit closer now. You'll start to see the crystals disappearing as we collect them. You don't need to do anything apart from just fly close to them once you're below 300. Remember accelerating and decelerating use fuel so do moving in different directions. Once the last crystal is gone the scanner will revert to extreme zoom and we can check out what we've collected after closing the cargo bay doors naturally. We see here we've collected 31 kilograms of class D minerals and have sustained zero damage. Textbook. After you've gathered enough minerals it's time to go to a planet and sell them. We select various planets from the galactic map. Planets are rated on obviously their coordinates, economy, helpfulness, honesty and mineral base. This planet has an excellent economy, which means you'll get excellent prices for your minerals, but also pay through the nose for fuel and repairs. Honesty is very good, which means your mechanic will do a cracking job. This planet's honesty is quite bad. Expect any repairs to appear on the space version of Watchdog, because your ship will be a potential death trap. Planets with bad economies are great places to buy fuel and get repairs, but awful places to sell minerals. The mineral base also affects the price of the minerals. The further away from the letter you are, the rarer the mineral and the higher the price. Once you've selected your planet, you press H, enter hyper jump, rather nice, uh, you know, faster than light effect here. You now need to use your fuel to get close to the planet as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then enter the atmosphere at low speed to avoid damage. Before entering the atmosphere you must make sure that all your systems apart from the engine are switched off because entering the atmosphere will fry any system that's currently on. So that's the boosters, the docking bay doors, the shields, all will be rendered completely inoperable by entering the atmosphere. And again, the faster you enter the atmosphere, the more damage you take. And here we are now under an alien magenta sky, dropping now to some lovely parallax mountains. Two levels of mountains, so in a bit of distance. And we're dropping altitude. We're now in atmosphere. So we need to increase our speed and head towards the landing strip in the distance. So there are different levels of parallax. So the front mountains move more than the rear mountains, again with the, um, the, well, that works also with altitude as well. So you can see in the distance there is a landing strip and that's where we're heading towards. It's like a little flight sim. As you get close to the land you need to lower your landing gear and then and try to get a nice smooth landing. Put your brakes on and then once you come to a halt disengage your engine and then you're ready to train. Get into chatting with alien traders, which are nicely animated and voiced. You can chat normally, but there's also a series of stock phrases which you can call up by pressing symbol shift and various characters, including how much would it give for, in this case, class D minerals? 18 pounds per ton, I'm selling 31, I've made some money. Note on the planet there is a helpfulness gauge. This planet we're coming up is abysmal. This is how likely the alien is to go off topic. So here is a vastly speeded up discussion with an alien. I'm desperately trying to sell minerals and get repairs and everything I ask for, he blows me off with some old jibber jabber.
You can eventually get an answer out of them. I spent 20 minutes trying to get this little bastard to talk to me properly. That is the main gameplay loop. Collect minerals in space, sell minerals on planets, buy fuel. What are the obstacles? Well, there's starvation. After 2 hours 51 minutes, you run out of food and you'll starve to death. Well, obviously, stalkers, you just buy food. There's a slight problem here. You can ask for food on the planet and they'll sell you food. Let's have 10 kilos of food and look, something's changed and it's not food. Let's have an action replay. You can't buy food. If you run out of money, you get wiped out by the Ron Nice Co credit agency. They do pay you interest so you won't run out of money that way. However, if you spend too much or get fined, then it is game over. You also die if your ship gets destroyed. You can damage your ship by entering the atmosphere too hard, doing a hard landing, crashing into minerals, but there's also the police to watch out for, and they can be rather aggressive. <coughs> so you see here they've pulled out, pulled you over, just saying hello, which is fine. <coughs> but sometimes uh, you may be speeding slightly, and then the police will just show up, ram your ship and destroy <coughs> you, where you would previously have only received a £15 fine. If you spot the police in time, you can turn on your photon shield to protect you. This costs you fuel, and it runs through fuel surprisingly quickly. However, it does protect you from impact. A collision with a police craft at speed, though, will destroy your shield, such that if you have another encounter with the police before you get it repaired, it's game over. You cannot save the game. Game over is for real. Things which are illegal are using boosters near police ships, stealing money from planet. It's times like these you get quite sentimental for old Terence. If you use your hyperdrive while in the vicinity of a police ship, you would escape the police but also destroy that ship. And they don't like that either. And don't think that having deep pockets will shield you from the long arm of the law indefinitely because on your 256th arrest, the police will just execute you as a threat to the galaxy. Running out of fuel is fatal. Damage to engines and boosters greatly increases your fuel consumption, as does using a hyperjump. That takes several thousand units of fuel. And after a hyperjump, you still need to get to the planet and then land safely, which also requires several hundred units of fuel. You can't buy food. Does that mean you can't win? If we had a visit from Mr. Poke, you would then find that you would win after 13 hours or so. But that's poking and cheating. We don't like doing that, not on this channel. You can buy insurance, which covers food, fuel, or your ship. Whenever you make a claim, it restores that item to the state it was when you got the insurance aid. Which is insurance fraud, really, because if you have a full tank of petrol and then use it by driving, you then can't claim it's been destroyed in a fire. You do this, and every two hours or so, you claim on insurance, and then eventually, after... 14 and a half hours, you would win for the power of compound interest. That's not really fair play though. This is, however, I have a six hour video where Ollie Oddgood collects minerals, sells them, buys food and fuel, nearly runs out of food and fuel, has run ins with the law, and eventually succeeds in winning the game properly. It's an interesting budget game. Let's make it better! some lovely Class B minerals for you. Freshly harvested from space itself. What do you say? Now, Space Terrence, would you be so kind as to unload these for the gentleman? Parasites! So how do we make a machine code program better? The answer starts in Sinclair user number 59 from March 1987, teaching you how to make your own pokes. Pokes are a common cheat for ZX Spectrum games, a way of modifying the 
code as written into doing something useful, for example, giving you extra lives. First key is working out how the game is loaded. And you do that by not using load, but using the merge command. And this gives us a look at the loader. We do a check to make sure you haven't got strange peripherals in. We load a screen, we load our machine code, we load another screen, and then we finally execute some code at position 27629. This is a machine code program, the code that the Spectrum actually operates. It is not an assembly language program, which you can read and understand. What you have is a series of numbers, and depending on the order which you execute them, these numbers could be instructions, they could be text strings, they could be variables, they could be offsets. So what do we do? One option is to use a disassembler. Commercial dis disassemblers are available, but there are also some available from typing books. This is from the Spectrum Pocket Book by Phipps Associates, written by Trevor Toms. And here I am disassembling, just for fun, the ZX Spectrum ROM, which starts at address zero. You can compare this to the complete Spectrum ROM disassembly by Dr. Ian Logan and Dr. Frank O'Hara, and you find that it's accurate. This is pretty useful, and you can also print this out to, to hard copy to disassemble the machine code for Enterprise. We need to enter the clear command to make sure our basic program doesn't delete the machine code. We know what to clear because if we found that in the loader. We then load the machine code We're using the load code command, swapping tape as we would do. And then finally, we load the disassembler. Ah, it doesn't fit. The disassembler is 8.5K. And got it down to 7k and that's still not nearly enough. We can't fit a quart into a pint pot. 1980s problems call for modern solutions, one of which is provided by Schoolkit, a selection of utilities used to disassemble ZX Spectrum programs. Run it against a snapshot of memory and with a bit of prompting and coaching you get out either a HTML page showing you what you, the memory is used for or indeed a full assembly listing that you can then use to reassemble it. To work out what's actually going on though, will require a lot of work. And I'm a lazy, lazy man. So I'm going to do it my way. We can't buy food. We need to know where the food is held. So you start the game, and then in an emulator, i.e. spectaculator, you can pause it. Food starts at 500 kilograms. We then go into the memory. In spectaculator, you start off in hexadecimal mode. You can switch that to turn it off so you can see numbers more easy. And then you can press Control F for find and start looking for 500. Our first hit is address 27356, which the disassembler in Spectacular says it's call P0001, which is a rather odd instruction. What you can often do is score up ever so slightly to see the byte before it. And by doing that, you see that the byte before it is zero, which is a knob, which is just that this is a data value. It may not be food, though. We have another hit at 27803. Scrolling up slightly tells us that, that this is actually loading 500 into the HL pair of registers. The next instruction loads that value into address 34629. And the instruction after that loads 9999 into HL, which is the amount of fuel we start with. Have you also found the location of fuel at 43073? Let's confirm our suspicions. We check the status report to see we have 499 kilograms of food. We then pause and go into the emulator and look at the address 34629, which contains 2431, which is 256 plus 243. We then go to poke it. We're changing the 243 into 255. And then we go back and we check the report and we find we have more food than we started. The game we now need to find lot. places in memory that address the food. So we do a search and we get a hit at 29103. So if we scroll up slightly, we find that we're loading 34629 into HL. We're then loading 0 into BC and then subtracting BC from HL. That doesn't make a lot of sense, so that's subtract. We don't want subtract, we want add. So we look again, we get hit at 33619. Scroll up slightly to 33618, where we load food into HL. And then we add BC to HL. So what we need to do now is set a breakpoint on 33618. We're now in discussion with the alien. We believe that 33618 is where we buy food. So we're actually now going to buy food and hopefully see the breakpoint triggered. Elementary, my deal. And it isn't. Does anything call 33618? Well, we've got a hit here at 33555. Let's scroll up one. And yeah, it looks like we do something. And then there's a conditional jump to 33618. So let's set a breakpoint here at 33564. So we're going to try and buy fuel. Yes, we have a trigger. Uh, 33564 is called if we're buying fuel. AF is not in hexadecimal, so you can't see what A actually is. But if we switch to hexadecimal mode, we see that A, at the, at the address we're interested in, now contains 3. 
and zero is not set, therefore we carry on to buying fuel. Now if you buy food, we hit the same address, and the accumulator contains two. The zero flag is not set because we haven't gone to zero. Therefore, we'll then carry on to buying fuel, even though we've asked to buy food. What if we just set the zero flag on in the emulator? If we do this, then we immediately jump to 33618, which is us buying food. And if we then look at the real data, we'll find that we now have more food than we started with. So how are we going to fix this food fuel problem? Science! Here's the situation. The accumulator contains four if we're buying fuel. It contains three if we're buying food. We need to execute different code based on this distinction. What have we got? Decrement accumulator, but it will set flags appropriately. Jump on zero to 63118. This will never work. Science. Logical choice number one. You compare the accumulator with three, which does a fake subtract and sets flags appropriately. And then jump on zero, so if it is three, to 63118. This would work, nothing wrong with that, perfectly logical. But compare the accumulator with three requires two bytes. And jump on zero, three, three, six, or eight requires three bytes. We've only got four bytes. Science! Logical choice number two. We jump relative on zero to a relative address. Compare A3 requires two bytes. Jump relative zero value requires two bytes. And the where we're jumping to is within range. There's a problem though. Science speed. Each machine code instruction takes a different number of T states. The original took four T states for the decrement accumulator and then 10 for the jump on 0 to 63118. The new version takes seven T states for the compare three and then either seven or 12 for the jump relative. Jump relative is a smaller instruction but can take a little bit longer. So that's either 14 or 19. We need an instruction that fits in one byte and one byte only and differentiates between four and three. RRA is the one we want. It does a right good rotation of the bits in the accumulator. We start off with four. The four bit is one. The carrier flag is off. Everything moves to the right. 128 becomes 64, becomes 32, etc, etc. The one in four becomes two. The zero in one gets moved to the carry flag and it remains as zero. Now let's look at it with three. We have ones in the two and the one position. Carry flag is zero. We move to the right. The one in the two position becomes one in the one position. The one in the one position moves to the carry flag, which is now one. The carry flag is now set. We have a difference. RRA takes four T states, exactly the same as decrement A. We then change jump on zero to jump on carry, and we operate at the exact same speed. Diverse alien. If you consider classic sci-fi full of strange new worlds and strange new beings to encounter. In Enterprise, you have five trillion planets, but you always talk to the same green bloke. How are we going to do this? What code is it? Where could it be? Let's watch that again in slow motion. The scanner on the left starts out black and white, then there's a burst of static, and then we get our little green alien friend. During the static phase, we're going to pause the emulator and then enter the debugger. This puts us into the debugger, into a mess of subroutines and loop. You can set breakpoints on return statements and you keep doing this and hope you'll find something that appears of interest. So, just below where I was, where I was executing in this loop, loading a four into the accumulator, followed by a call to a subroutine. Now four immediately intrigued me because four is the ZX Spectrum code for green. What does 455732 contain? That loads 23113 into HL. Now 23113 is in the attribute area. So I set a breakpoint on 55795. And when executing, I then change the accumulator to 107, which is cyan, paper, and magenta ink, and bright. Let it run and see what we get. And we get indeed a bright cyan background, magenta alien. We found the bit we need to change. Problem is, we have two bytes to work with. There are some small instructions to load things into the accumulator. I tried various values from the registers, and we either got flashing aliens or, or invisible aliens. Then Raymond Russell on Twitter made the sensible suggestion, you can always jump to another location in memory. But, but there's, there's, no, there's no space. What if we call a different subroutine that does something else first, then calls the main one? Brilliant. All we need to do is find a bit of memory where we can stick our little subroutine. 
Good places in memory to store things in include the printer buffer, which unfortunately, on an experimentation, I found was being used. I then went looking for various bits of memory that weren't being used. I then did a search for a series of bytes that were all zero. This led me to find out where the status of the ship was held and the location of the minerals. Eventually, I found a small amount of memory, but what should we put into the accumulator? How about something related to the colour of the sky? How is the colour of the sky set? In a similar way as before, you activate the debugger just as you're entering the atmosphere and then look for calls to a subroutine, anything of interest that sets the sky. And this led us to the address 40590, which is in the attribute of the sky, which is either bright or not bright and seems to vary from red all the way up to white, never blue. So in that case, why not take that value, subtract one from it, and use that as the colour of the alien. Fixing the end screen. After winning, I noticed the time on the Ollie Odgood screen was a bit odd. I thought, well, maybe I didn't win in six hours, but in five hours, five minutes. When I uploaded the video to YouTube, no, it was genuinely six hours, and it wasn't some kind of inconsistency in the code. If you win after five minutes by cheating with pokes, it all works fine. We have 10 minutes, you get 0, 0, colon, 0, colon, colon, 0, 0. If you die after 30 minutes, 0, 0, colon, 2, colon, colon, 0, 0. I decided to follow the money because the game does two things on five minute intervals. You receive interest on your credit with the Ron Nisco credit agency, and you also have to pay out your insurance premiums. If they're too much, you go bankrupt and you get wiped out. This is how you can run out of money at a time interval. We can easily find where money is, 27356, and then we find the initialization section where we see us loading 500 into 27356, that's money, but above that we see loading of 10,000 into 27360, which is the amount of money you need to win the game. And we find this little section here, which has all kind of strange rotations of bits, but at the end of it we do some calculations involving our, the amount of money, 27356, the amount of money for Paradise, 27360, and then jump to 35459. 35459 loads 6 into the HL register pair and then jumps to 3510. We've seen that winning the game is triggered at the end of a paying interest section. What calls that section, which is at 28958, is only called twice in the entirety of the code. And it's in this area here where we do things like comparing something with 5 and comparing something with 10 and then calling as necessary. This is the clock routine. And on return from the call, we then do the carrying of digits forward. Except if we win the game, we do not return from the call. My first attempt at a fix was to move the call statement until after we've dealt with carrying the 10. After 10 minutes, our data all works lovely. Unfortunately, after an hour, we get zero hours and 60 minutes. You need to do all carrying first. If you were on a 10 minute interval, do the call. I then tested that you could win on five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, an hour and five, hour and 10, 10 hours, even a hundred hours. Putting it all together, rather than just doing it haphazardly, I wrote a little basic program to do it for me. And this program does a clear command which protects the machine code from basic. Load the original code from Mr. Ansel. First one is fixing the food bug. Then we change the alien color. This involves changing the call to the scanner routine to a new area instead. This also requires us to save more machine code because this is an area that wasn't previously machine code. And then finally, we look at fixing the end screen. After doing this, we save to tape. And then the new, the new snorkified version has this bit of machine code instead of the original. To prove it all works, I've landed on a planet with nice magenta sky, go to chat to an alien, and all oh, the aliens red. How much is their food? £13 per kilo. Well, let's have 255 kilos. Let's go for the, the lot. You can't have more than that. And I'm not going to pay. Let's now check our inventory. And we find we have 715 kilos of food. And after a bit of the use of the GMI code, John Rand has is RIP, retired in paradise after 20 minutes, and the code is all correct. Huzzah! I had to lead on the ZX Spectrum. I really wanted to like it. I had trouble with the controls. On the ZX Spectrum, you can't redefine the keys. You can control your pitch, and you can control your roll. You can't just go left or right. No, you have to roll first and then go up or down. I wasn't used to the keys, therefore I would inadvertently activate a cheat. And this cheat would mean whenever I went to a new system, I would be ambushed by four very powerful spacecraft and die. I think I managed to achieve this either by 
maximum pitch and roll while hyperspace or pausing and pressing a button. And however you activate it, unless you follow the same exact instructions to get out again, you're stuck there forever and you're dead. And also, I just couldn't dock. So I played a lot more Enterprise than I did Elite. I did eventually get a version of Elite called Free Trader on the iPad, which is lovely because you can just roll at a nice gentle pace and you can dock and it's really good fun. I'll leave you now with Arthur. Hello there. You caught me relaxing now on the lovely Paradise Planet. We've got delicious drinks. We've got the finest fresh food. And of course, the most convivial company. Just don't tell her indoors, eh? Thank you for watching, and hopefully we'll see you again in paradise. Toodaloo.